Uh, good afternoon, my friends. Uh, my name is Ming. Uh, I'm the, my day job is being the head of the School of Personal Growth in Google University. And uh, one, of the things, one of the main things we do is to take advantage of the knowledge we gain from the cutting edge of brain sciences and use that knowledge to, to invent curriculum uh, to help Googlers upgrade and transform themselves. That's, that's what we do. And we hope that one day, when we, when we figure out how to make this work for Googlers, we can share this knowledge with the rest of the world so that everybody can benefit from personal growth in the workplace. And towards this, we are very delighted today to have a man who deeply shares our goals and aspirations, uh, Dr. Daniel Seeger. And he's just like us, except a lot smarter than me. Uh, Dan is a clinical professor at the UCLA School of Medicine. He's a co-director of the UCLA Mindfulness Awareness uh, Research Center and a co-investigator at the UCLA Center for Culture, Brain and Development. He's also the director of the Mindsight Institute and the author of the book, Mindsight, The New Science of Personal Transformation. Uh, in addition to all that, he is also the author of the book, The Mindful Brain, uh, or, and the, the other book, The Developing Mind, and Parenting from the Inside Out. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Daniel Siegel. Thank you, Meng. I, I really appreciate the uh, introduction and being invited to come speak with you today about what the mind is and how we can create a healthy mind. Uh, it's really a fascinating idea to think about what we know just intuitively, but yet we may not be able to define so easily what is our human mind. So you may be surprised to find, in fact, that fields that study the mind, like let's say the field of mental health, um, or even a field like education where you help people develop the mind, um, the individuals in those fields, the educators in those fields, actually often don't have a definition of the mind. And as a psychiatrist and trained as a researcher in developmental psychology and working in the field of attachment, looking at how kids' minds develop, what really struck me as um, amazing in my own field, psychiatry, was that I was never given even one lecture that defined what the mind is. Also, in the field of mental health, we had an orientation that lasted a long, long time, which was that health is the absence of symptoms. And so you didn't really have a working definition of the mind and you didn't have a definition of what a healthy mind would be. It just meant you didn't meet criteria for a disorder, so you must be healthy. Now, this is kind of strange. So when I started lecturing after the first book I wrote called The Developing Mind came out, which tried to make a definition of the mind that I'll share with you in a moment, what really struck me as amazing, and actually now I've had the opportunity to ask in person over 80,000 mental health practitioners all around the, the planet from every discipline of mental health you can imagine, psychiatry, psychology, social work, occupational therapy, psychiatric nursing, every field, the numbers are about the same. And how many people in the field of mental health do you think had even one lecture defining what the mind is? It turns out to be about two to five percent. So 95% of individuals in the field of mental health have never been given a definition of the mind. Now, when I started working in the uh, interdisciplinary world of bringing different sciences together years ago, the beginning of the decade of the brain, the beginning of the 1990s, I brought about 40 scientists together. And they also didn't have a working definition of the mind. And yet our task was to say, what's the connection between the mind and the brain, which is what we're going to talk about today. And so I offered them this definition, and all of them agreed on this definition, which is an amazing thing. If you know how academics works, you usually don't find convergence of an opinion. But here, people agreed with it. And here's what the definition I offered them was, and I'll give you an expanded one in just a moment. The simplest definition of the mind that these scientists agreed upon goes like this. 
that the mind is a process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Now, the human mind happens in a couple of ways. It happens in a body, of course. It happens, so it's embodied. It happens through our extended nervous system that's distributed throughout the whole body. And I'm going to use the word brain just to refer to that because extended nervous system distributed throughout the whole body is hard to keep on repeating. But when I say the word brain, that's what I mean. But what's happening now between me and you? What what's goes on right now? Or let's say in Google, when you allow people to have a transfer of energy and information among them, among each other. That's what you can call sharing energy and information. So in many ways, the mind is not just embodied, it's also relational. Okay, so we can say then the mind can be defined, it's a working definition, as an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy information. Now you may say, well that sounds really natural, you may not agree, you may agree, but it's actually a working definition. And what's really striking is when you sit down with scientists who study the mind, let's say like psychologists or brain scientists are interested in the mind, even philosophers who study the mind, which is what I've had the opportunity to do, here's the striking thing. Almost none of them will define the mind. And they'll say things like, the mind is undefinable, or the human mind shouldn't be defined, or we'll be limited if we define it because we don't know everything about it. So what I say in response to that is, I totally get those concerns, but if we don't define a word, how can we actually use the word with each other? Why would we have a word? And some people say, well, it's just a placeholder for something we really don't understand. And that's okay, and then you're still in the dark. You're still doing what we've done in mental health for all these years. When you define the mind as a process that regulates the flow of energy and information, it changes what you can do for defining a healthy mind. It also changes, in a very practical way, the approach you can take to strengthen the mind. Let me give you an example. If you buy into it, just for now, the notion that the mind is a regulatory process, what does it take to regulate? If you say, just on the simplest level, I want to take a person coming to me as a friend or coming to me professionally if you're a therapist, and I want to strengthen their mind. At a minimum, what do you need to do? What does it take to regulate something? Anyone here in engineering? Okay, you need to measure it. You need to have some way to measure or monitor the thing that you're regulating. And we're saying the thing is energy and information flow. So at a very minimum, you need to have a way to monitor and measure, maybe not quantitatively, but to assess, to monitor, to observe that which you're going to influence, which is the second thing in regulation. If you're driving a car and you're watching, if someone has tied your hands behind your back and tied your feet together, you can't influence the thing that you're trying to regulate. So monitoring and modifying are the two essential components of regulation. So once we define the mind, especially in this way, you get a new insight into how to actually create a stronger mind. You'd be amazed, but a lot of people live their lives just having thoughts and feelings, beliefs and attitudes having hopes and dreams and memories and perceptions, all the stuff that we can use to describe the mind, those aren't definitions, they're descriptions of mental activity, but they haven't developed the capacity to actually observe those mental activities as the flow of energy and information, as the mind itself. So that process of being able to see mental activity with more clarity and then modify it with more efficacy is something that you can name with the word mind sight. This ability to actually see your mind, not just have one. Now it may sound kind of almost simplistic, but when you look at different areas of research, what you find is that when mind sight is present, various ways of understanding mental health are also present. There's something about being able to see and influence your internal world that creates more health. I'll give you an example. Let's say someone 
had a huge feeling of anger going on inside of them, and they had no way of monitoring that. Would the anger go away? No, they'd still have anger, right? The anger would still be changing their physiology, but they wouldn't have the capacity to have what's called discernment, to take a step away from mental activity and notice, I have anger. The anger would sweep them up, and if you're an eight-year-old on the playground of a school, and someone takes your ball, you may slug that kid, right?